Around 250 years ago, the French physicist and philosopher Pascal inadvertently developed an early version of the modern roulette wheel. Attempting to develop a perpetual motion device, he unfortunately didn't succeed and managed to create instead a perpetual money-making device, mostly obviously for the casinos that own it. But my question to you today is, is there a way to turn the tables and reliably win at roulette? It turns out, if you understand the mathematics behind the game, then maybe. Today, we're talking about the Martingale strategy. In a European casino, there are 18 red spaces, 18 black spaces, and one green space. This edges the probability in the casino's favor and is how ultimately the house makes a profit. If you bet on a red and the ball lands on a red, you get double the money that you staked on that bet. If it, however, it lands on a black or a green, you lose. This will be the only type of bet that we will use in this circumstance. Given that there are 37 spaces and 18 of those are red, the odds of success are just under 49%, slightly below that of a coin flip. But can we beat the odds by employing a strategy to win back any losses? This is the purpose of the Martingale strategy, first documented in its use well before the 18th century, for how to place bets to reliably recover any losses you've made and make a small profit. Let's look at an example. We are interested in betting the minimum amount possible each time. Let's assume it's a dollar. If we win, great, bet again and spin again. If we lose, however, we start the martingale to win back our losses. Losing means we're down a dollar. To win that dollar back, assuming winnings are double the bet that you place, we need to bet another dollar to clear our loss to zero. If we lose that though, our losses are now $2. To win that money back, we'd now need to bet $2. So our winnings would be $4, clearing out the bet that we just made as well as our initial losses. If we lose, however, that would mean we're down $4. So we would need now to bet $4 for the potential of winning $8. If we lose though, we need now to bet $8 for the potential of winning 16 and so on and so forth. If you skip that first dollar bet, you actually come out of this process with a tidy $1 profit guaranteed. There's a really simple pattern here starting to emerge. When you win, awesome, take the win, then bet the same amount of money again, your minimum bet. But if you lose, however, start the martingale strategy. Double your losing bet and bet again and keep doing it until you win. Once you've won, drop your bet down to the normal first minimum bet and rinse and repeat until you're coolly drinking martinis on your own private island. But hang on, this feels too good to be true. Surely casinos would have gone out of business a long time ago if it was this easy. To really understand where or why this works and where and why it doesn't work, we need to look deeper at the mathematics and a class of problems called optimal stopping problems. These make or break this strategy. But before we get there, I have to thank today's sponsor, Babbel. Something that has far higher payout than learning any gambling strategy is learning a new language. I get it, learning something new is hard, especially if your New Year's resolution has faltered and failed you in the past, but Babbel has got your back. It has expertly crafted lessons, addictive games, immersive podcasts, and even live classes, all designed for you to have real world conversations. I work with scientists who come from many different countries and backgrounds, and it's a real advantage to make an effort instead of expecting everyone to speak English. 2024 goal of mine is to become a two language minimum human being. And for me, Babbel has been an indispensable tool on this journey, and I have for the first time actually enjoyed the process of learning a language. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world and gets straight to the point by teaching you how to use language in real world scenarios. It makes the prediction that your language skills would have improved significantly in just 20 days of use and if you disagree there is a money back guarantee covering that time. If you hurry you can get 60% off your subscription during the new year's sale link provided down below and I definitely recommend checking it out before the offer expires. Thank you to Babbel for keeping science content free on the internet now back to the video. The theory of optimal stopping is concerned with the problem of choosing a time to take a given action based on sequentially observed random events in order to maximize an expected payout or to minimize an expected cost. Although optimal stopping doesn't guarantee free money here, choosing when to stop has immense importance in many fields. Let's say you recently watched a video on bats and their anti-aging capabilities. This has inspired you to develop an anti-aging cream. Like any good scientist, you want to test whether Benjamin Baton cream will turn back the 
clock. So you train an AI system to assess people's ages through photographs. Do they look younger or older than their biological age? These groups are split into two, with one being given a placebo moisturizer. Initially, you say, let's look at 225 people for each group, give them the creams, and see if there is a statistical difference between the two groups. After we run the full 225 people, here are the results. 47 from the placebo group look younger than their age, versus 51 from the magic cream group. Huh. Looks like the formulation didn't quite work. You're a good scientist, you go back to the drawing board, but let's take a closer look at the results. When we had only tested 132 subjects, things actually looked quite different. Only 25 people in the placebo group looked younger, compared to a much higher 38 in the magic cream group. A less rigorous scientist might have stopped the trial there, said it's time to publish and get this business off the ground. You, however, are an ethical scientist. The point remains though, by choosing when to get out of the game, we can skew the results in our favor. This is exactly what we're trying to achieve in the casino and exactly the opposite of what you should do when you do good science. But the question is, if there really isn't a difference between the placebo and the magic cream, how do we end up with such a wide divergence in the outcomes? That comes from unlikely outcomes being much more likely than we actually think, and that's also one of the greatest dangers of the Martingale strategy. Let's look at a slightly simpler but analogous problem, flipping a coin. What's the chance that you get five heads in a row? It feels like a pretty small chance, right? A 50% chance five times, or one half raised to the fifth power, which is one over 32, or something around 3% likelihood to actually happen. By comparison, what's the chance of getting this random set of heads and tails? It looks way more probable. The interesting thing is that it isn't. The chance is exactly the same, one half to the fifth, or about 3%. That's a problem for us when it comes to the Martingale strategy for two reasons. The first is because doubling your bet if you lose becomes expensive exponentially quickly. For a $1 bet lost, you need to bet $2. If you lose again, then you bet $4. If you lose again, then you bet 8. Then 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, $1,024, etc, etc. How much money you have dictates how long of a losing streak you can survive, and surely with $127, say, in your back pocket, you can tolerate seven losses. And what is the probability that you lose seven times in a row? Surely that's really low. If this is a coin toss bet and you always bet on tails, that would mean that you can survive seven heads in a row being flipped. Now getting seven heads in a row has a probability of one half raised to the seventh power, which is about 0.8% or less than one percentage probability that it actually happens. That seems like surely it won't happen. So in theory, we're all good to play, right? Well, that brings us to problem number two. It does happen, and it happens a lot more than you might expect. This is because these seemingly very rare events of seven heads in a row actually can be quite commonplace the longer we play. Let's say we're playing a whole evening of coin flipping and we have $100 to our name. What is the likelihood that we get this seven heads in a row loss situation actually happening? To understand this, we can model it as a Markov chain. Markov chains are useful for looking at probability of an event happening given a history of past events. The state diagram for a coin flip might look something like this. We have two states and a 50-50 chance to transition between them or stay on the current state. We can either flip tails and then flip tails again, flip heads or flip heads again, or flip tails and then transition to heads and then transition to tails. To understand the likelihood of finding a row of seven heads in our entire night of flipping coins, it's easier to think about this if we build ourselves a little board game that matches the logic of the coin flipping subtype. Task. Imagine a board with a row of eight squares with the squares labeled 0 to 7. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. You start with your marker on square 0 and start flipping a coin. If it comes up heads, you move your marker forward. If it comes up tails, you go back to 0. You finish the game when your marker reaches square seven, because that's analogous to losing seven times in a row and means that you can't make the next bet. We can write out a transition matrix for this process. We'll take the end square to be an end state or an absorbing state and build a matrix that reflects the probabilities of moving from one given square to the others. 
The rows represent the current square and the columns represent the square after the next flip. Each entry in this matrix represents the probability of transitioning from the state in the leftmost column to the state in the top row. For example, the entry in the third row and the fourth column represents the probability of moving from two consecutive heads to three consecutive heads, which is 50% since you need to flip a head. As there's a 50% chance of flipping heads or tails at any given flip, there's always a 50% chance of moving back to state zero and needing to start the process again. What this means is we would have won back our earnings. At stage 7, the game terminates, so the probability there is 1. If we've raised this matrix to the power of 200, representing an evening of 200 spins, and look at the transition from state 0 to 7 by multiplying it by that vector, we get a probability of around 54% or a higher chance you lose your money during the night than you win. That's weird and seems kind of counterintuitive, but let's look at it in action. I found an online calculator and asked it to simulate 200 flips. Surely enough, on the very first time asking it, I got a run of seven heads in a row game over. All this is of course predicated on the idea that you can only survive seven losses in a row. If you had more money, you could survive more losses, but this amount of money goes up really fast. Slightly over $100 allowed you to survive seven losses. You need slightly over $1,000 though to survive just 10 losses. You need over a hundred thousand to get to an extra 17 losses and you need over a million to survive 20 spins. Here the idea that you're putting down a million dollars just to win your money back, not even to make a profit, is kind of a scary position to be in. But still it is in theory possible. Why doesn't the house lose? For a much simpler reason it turns out, usually the upper limit that you can bet is capped. If you can buy in at a dollar, maybe they cap the maximum spin at $100, limiting the length of losses that you can endure. And obviously that pesky green skews the odds further out of your favor. Even after we've said all of this, maybe slightly paradoxically, it turns out the Martingale strategy is still a good strategy just not in the long run. If you want to win in the short term, it actually works pretty well. Let's look at an example to illustrate that point. Say you've gone on a night out and you've lost your phone, your cards, your friends, and your memory of everything except this video, and all you have is $14 to your name, but the taxi ride home will be $16. You see a casino out of the corner of your eye. The question is, should you go? And the answer, is yes. The math in this instance is in your favor. You go out and you find a roulette table and let's even take into account the idea that the green zero space causes everyone to lose in this instance so that it is accurate. If you place your bet on red, this gives you an 18 over 37 or slightly below 49% probability of winning. You place your first bet. It should be $2. There is a near 49% chance you win straight away and you earn the money that you need to get the taxi ride. If you lose however, you bet $4. This gives you another 49% chance of winning and making that taxi. If you lose now, however, the last chance is that you bet $8. Either you win that $16 and you can go home, or your immediate situation of being stuck isn't actually that much worse. The chance of losing every single round in a row is 19 over 37 times 19 over 37 times 19 over 37, or about 14%. The chance of winning is therefore 1 minus the chance of losing, or or about 86%. So in this instance, because we're not trying to maximize over the long term, this strategy actually really works. These three spins gives you an 86% probability that you will not only get home, but also have a great story along with it. And to me, that sounds like it's absolutely worth it. If you like this video, leave a like. If you'd like to sign up to be an alpha tester of Benjamin Baton Miracle Cream, leave a comment here with pass me the baton and head over to see the video of just how cool bats and anti-aging properties really are. Thanks as always, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.